Hello, and welcome back to Earth Star Observatory. I'm Lily Walker, and I'm an astrologer and a religious educator practicing classical astrology from the foundation of esoteric studies and the perennial wisdom teachings. And today I'm here to present the second video in the series on Ivan the Terrible and forecasting the time of his death. This portion of the e-zine is about the backstory of Ivan the Terrible and has a lot to do with the Eastern and Western branches of Christendom, Christendom. Okay, so let me share the screen. Okay, backstory. History of the Russian crown and the Eastern Orthodox Church. The backstory of Ivan the Terrible. A proper study of Ivan Vasilievich begins with a backstory. For Ivan was not just a man or even a king. Ivan was the very first czar of all Russians and also the first holy emperor of the Eastern Orthodox Church at Moscow, the third Rome. With this sort of epithet, it's likely no surprise that it's a bit of a tangled web of aggressive, dark-aged episodes aimed at nation-building and officially sanctioned unholy calculations aimed at instituting divine right that Ivan was destined to be born into on August 25th, 1530. As the story goes, Ivan arrived at 6 p.m. in the evening amid a thunderous downpour. As his father, Vasily, drew back the heavy red velvet curtain, the windows clamored and lightning flashed in the distance. Ivan came in with a bang. Ivan was the first child of Vasily Ivanovich and Elena Glingsakya. However, the real might of his ancestral claim as heir to the Russian state lay upon the legacy of his paternal grandfather, Ivan III. Similarly, his claim to divine right and authority as bequeathed upon him by the Eastern Orthodox Church came through his paternal grandmother, Zoe Sophia Palagonia, <laughs> via her connection by bloodline to Constantine, the founding emperor of Constantinople. Therefore, in order to unravel the various threads of politics, philosophy, and saga that surround Ivan at the time of his birth, it is necessary to discuss both the state of the relationship between the Eastern and Western branches of Christendom and that of the Russian state during the reign of Ivan III, Ivan the Great, and his queen consort, Sophia. The history of the rift between the Vatican, the Western branch of Christendom, and the Eastern Orthodox branch is complex. Under the United Empire of the First Rome, the Eastern seat of Christendom was established at Constantinople, then called Byzantium, to aid the Western seat, located in Rome, Italy, in governing, governing over the vast empire. In this time, the two seats of the ecclesiastical empire functioned in relative harmony, working together to rule over a unified whole. However, when Rome fell to the Goths in 410 AD, the seat of the Roman Empire was eventually moved to that of the Eastern branch at Constantinople under the ruler Constantine the Great. In this time, Byzantium was renamed Constantinople and became the second Rome. Constantinople was an epicenter of art, culture, and commerce. And although Constantinople did face various uprisings and advances from the neighboring empires, most notably the Ottoman Turks, the Eastern Orthodox Church had a strong footing there and a large territory of land to rest its throne and legitimacy upon. The story was different, however, in Rome, Italy. Civil disrest, violence, and threats from neighboring territories had reached such a height in Rome that by the year 754 AD, Pope Stephen felt called to rise to the challenge of mighty Hannibal, who famously crossed the Alps in the middle of winter. Only when Stephen peered over those mighty Alps, it was not as the conqueror that legends are made of, but as a desperate emissary seeking life-saving help to stabilize the situation of violent chaos and anarchy in Italy from Pepin the Short in France. 
The result of this meeting was that in exchange for being named Patrician of Rome, or a patriarch of the noble aristocracy of Rome, and a blessing conf that conferred divine right and a divine claim to the throne to his bloodline, Pepin gave Pope Stephen a handful of recently conquered cities. The transaction provided Pepin with an extremely legitimate claim to the French throne for ages to come, not to mention made him a legend. For the Vatican, this transaction provided the legal basis for the creation of the papal states owned by the Vatican. This meant that suddenly the Vatican, and more specifically the current Pope, was an extremely wealthy and powerful landowner. This development changed the dynamics of the position drastically. Suddenly, the position became very attractive to powerful noble families who cared more for power and control than for pious devoted service to the cross. The moral sanctity of the position from this point on becomes a steep grade freefall into politics, intrigue, and assassination. At times, it might even be argued that in the Vatican, certain nuanced doctrinal arguments that arose after this point were settled in such a way as to favor the retention of power and authority over the Western Empire, as opposed to that which was truly in the best interest of souls seeking salvation and refuge in the cross. It might also be argued that the Eastern Orthodox Church during this time period may have responded with more authenticity to the true faith and less gray area being called into the true faith in service of nation building by way of religion. It might additionally be argued that the story in the Eastern Orthodox branch of the faith changes a bit when the tables turn during the reign of Ivan the Great and Moscow finds itself in a period of nation building. Whatever the motive behind the cards and how they were being played, it is true that there was a game of cards being played here between the two branches of Christendom. As nuanced disagreements in the doctrine, liturgy, and ritual arose, the Eastern and Western churches often resolved them differently. These differences began to add up, and it caused problems between the two seats of power. The Western seat of the Vatican in Italy reached the height of its glory in 750 AD when Pepin's son, Charlemagne, united the kingdoms of Western and Central Europe from his home country in France. The Vatican, by way of Pope Leo III, crowned Charlemagne Holy Roman Emperor over all the Romans, forming an alliance between his kingdom and the papal states of the Vatican. In this way, Charlemagne became the first emperor to rule from the Western Europe since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. As foretold, imbalances in the distribution of land, wealth, and power, coupled with growing doctrinal rift between the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic branches of the Christian church, served to drive the two major seats of Christendom into a war of animosity and a struggle for dominance. During this time, there were numerous councils called to try to reconcile the two branches of Christendom. The period of iconoclasm, 730 AD, or the war on icons, smashing of icons, and the great schism of 1054 are two major conflicts relative to this time period. The result of the Great Schism in 1054 was to officially split the United Kingdom of Christendom into two distinct factions, the Western Roman Catholic Church under the Vatican and the Eastern Orthodox Church at Constantinople. Nevertheless, Constantinople remained heavily dependent on the Western Church and all the people of Christendom to help protect the Holy Lands and Constantinople itself. To this end, the Crusades to the Holy Lands, which took place between 1095 and 1271, all happened after the Great Schism. 
in this way, we can see that although the Western and Eastern branches of Christendom are theoretically separate and equal, due to the challenge of holding the Holy Lands from the advancing Ottoman Turks, the Eastern branch remained somewhat in debt and beholden to the Western branch as they were reliant upon it, their good graces in order to receive life-saving support. By the time Constantinople fell in 1453, the Vatican had grown powerful to the point of formally requesting the Eastern Orthodox branch of the faith to bow to the centralized authority of the Vatican and the Pope. In 1439, at the Council of Florence, preliminary agreements to this end were made and agreed upon by representatives from the Eastern Orthodox Church. However, the Prince of Muscovy, Vasily II, Ivan's great-grandfather, refused to honor the agreement. The Metropolitan, or the Eastern Orthodox Pope, who had agreed to these terms set out at the Council of Florence, was relieved of his duties in Moscow. With this act, Moscow began asserting independence from Constantinople and the Eastern seat of the Orthodox Church. In 1448, about seven years after the fallout from the Council of Florence, the Russian Orthodox Church installed their own bishop as Metropolitan of Kiev and all Russia with his seat in Moscow without the permission of the Eastern Orthodox Church in Constantinople. When Constantinople fell only five years later, many in Russia felt that it was punishment from God for unholy agreements made at the Council of Florence. Moscow and the seat of the Holy Russian Orthodox Empire there, however, had not cooperated with this agreement. In this way, Moscow began to be seen as the legitimate successor to Constantinople and the Third Rome. Its claim for divine right and legitimacy lay in the testimony that Moscow remained stable and strong in the aftermath of Constantinople's fall. As an aside, but worth noting, the environment and local flavor of Constantinople is reported to have been very different from the home of Emperor Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor over the Papal States in this time period. We know this because Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, a later descendant of Charlemagne and heir to his kingdom in France, was greatly inspired at her stay in Constantinople while on her journey as part of the Crusades, she stopped off for a visit there with her cousin. She was so taken with the city, in fact, that her swoon over it caused a real problem between her and her husband, and also stained her reputation somewhat. Eleanor got into trouble in Constantinople. Good trouble. And we know it was good trouble because it's through Eleanor and her magical stay in Constantinople that the warm breath of the goddess and all of her beauty and vitality makes her way back to the court of France and eventually to England and ends up inspiring the stories of knightly chivalry courtly love, and the grail quest that we find growing up around King Arthur, the Lady of the Lake, and the Sword and the Stone, and the Knights of the Round Table in England. For those familiar with the mythology and the ways these stories augment the faith and development of the culture they came up in, we understand that the Arthurian legends did much to re-enchant Christianity in ways that allowed for a more holistic spiritual practice for people who otherwise might have found the confines of traditional liturgy and worship in the Roman Catholic faith too limited. But what of Ivan the Terrible? Where do we find him in this story? For when we review the biography of the terrible Ivan Vasilievich, it quickly becomes apparent that he did not get blessed with the warm, rosy, flushed cheek romantic gifts and call to adventure that Eleanor of Aquitaine unveiled in Constantinople. No, Ivan's story is very different. Although there are elements in the biography of Ivan's family that reveal clues that speak to this question, the answer may have simply been 
that there was a distaste for Constantinople in general lingering in Muscovy after the perceived fallout from the Council of Florence. It was Moscow, not Constantinople, that had held the religious moral high ground. Perhaps the people of Russia were less impressed with the exotic teachings, literature, art, and flair of Constantinople than was Queen Eleanor? For as we will see in the story of Ivan the Great, the warm breath and aroma of these roses that were unveiled for Eleanor in Constantinople do eventually arrive and have their impact in Moscow. In Moscow, however, this element of the mysteries is dismissed, for in Moscow, it was not a time to question or quest. It was a time to gather in and put down roots, to huddle up for common protection, and to gather the lands. In this period, Russia is not a united state, but rather factions of feudal territories. The influence of the Mongols and the Golden Horde, along with contests from Lithuania and Poland, challenge the unity of the land. Ivan the Great, however, overcomes this challenge and from his seat in Moscow, gathers the territories of Russia under a common banner. This is a great boon to Ivan the Terrible, as by the time he ascends to the throne, he is not only Prince of Muscovy, but now he is czar of all Russians. As we will see, however, it is truly the queen consort and not the czar that the Russian people are most proud of. When we hear the stories of the Russian crown, the myths and legends as told and retold for generations among the Russian people, it's quite obvious that their hearts are with the queen. This is because where the king is understood to be executor of God's wrathful will and judgment, it's the queen who, by her mercy, persuades the king to exercise God's forgiveness. As mentioned previously, whereas the claim of Ivan IV to rule as czar of all Russians lay in the paternal lineage of his grandfather, his claim to divine right and authority as God's chosen representative, sovereign, judge, and executor as conferred upon him by the Eastern Orthodox Church came through his paternal grandmother, Zoe, Sophia. Zoe, Ivan the Great's second wife, was a princess connected by bloodline to Constantine, the founding emperor of Constantinople. Her father, Thomas, was the younger brother of the last emperor of Constantinople. When Constantinople fell, the family was forced into exile and split ways. Both Zoe's mother and father died shortly after, and Zoe was adopted by the papacy and spent the remainder of her childhood in the court of Pope Sixtus IV. In 1469, an alliance between the Vatican and the seat of the Russian Orthodox Church was suggested by Pope Paul II. The Vatican would offer the hand of Zoe to Ivan the Great as a means of accomplishing its objectives at the Council of Florence. Now that the seat of Eastern Orthodox Church had moved to Moscow, the third Rome, the Vatican hoped to get the Muscovy prince to accept the agreement he previously refused to acknowledge. For Ivan's part, it was Zoe's bloodline and the legitimacy the alliance brought to Moscow as the new Constantinople that he was most interested in. He trusted that Zoe would align with him her husband, and not the Vatican or the Pope that had adopted her when it came to the dispute of unification. And he was right. Zoe, now called Sophia, was devoted, tender, and loving queen consort to Ivan, and their rule is remembered as a glorious one. Ivan the Great was blessed with two male children. Ivan the Young, his firstborn son, was for a long time the heir apparent to the throne. Ivan the Young's mother, Maria of Tiver, was poisoned when he was nine years old. Five years later, 
his father married Zoe, who appears to have been a kind stepmother to him. Vasily III, Ivan the Great's second son, whose mother was Zoe, for some reason never earned an epithet. He is therefore sometimes affectionately referred to as Vasily the Adequate. The age difference between Ivan the Younger and his stepbrother Vasily is 21 years. Ivan the Great bestowed upon his eldest son, Ivan the Young, the title of Grand Prince, basically making his son his equal. The young Ivan distinguished himself in battle and earned a reputation for himself at the great standing on the Urga River in the battle against Akhmat Khan. <laughs> Ivan the Young was married to Elena of Moldova. As is customary, the alliance was aimed at uniting Moscow and Moldova. And as Ivan the Young was now ruling as Grand Prince along with his father, Elena's son, Dmitri, was in contest with Vasily as heir to the crown. Apparently, this contest is the source of intrigue, pitting Elena against Sophia as the two mothers each advanced their own son for the position of heir apparent after the death of Ivan the Young. As we might imagine, this situation was a vulnerability to the crown and a period that was highly politicized with nefarious dealings of entry. How much of the stories handed down are fact and how much a convenient narrative of fiction is unclear. What is clear, however, is that a heresy arrives arises within the close-in circles of the Russian crown and the Russian Orthodox Church, and Elena of Moldova and her son, Dmitri, are removed from the line of succession because of it. Now, this heresy is very important because the writings and philosophical gesalt of the theologian who emerges victorious in this controversy, Joseph Volotsky, ends up being the grounding source for Ivan the Terrible's spiritual tutelage and faith development. Ivan was trained by monks who were part of the inside circle of Volotsky's monastery. As we get into Ivan the Terrible's biography, we will see just how crucial this role is in both the spiritual and psychological development of Ivan. So it's important that we understand the Judaizing heresy in order to get a better idea of the religious beliefs and philosophical leanings of the school of thought Ivan was brought up in. It has been said that Ivan the Great is known as the gatherer of lands, as during his reign, the lands of the Muscovy, or Great Russian State, were both consolidated and liberated from the yoke of the Golden Horde, or the Mongols. With this consolidation of territory came increased trade and opportunities for communication among the territories. Whereas this brought a renaissance of new ideas and learning, it also brought problems. The city of Novgorod was known to be an epicenter of learning and culture. It was a free city, meaning that before succumbing to the rule of Ivan the Great, Novgorod ruled itself without oversight from a king. Therefore, the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom flourished in Novgorod, unimpeded by censure aimed at preserving the unquestioned authority of an autocrat. However, Novgorod did eventually succumb to the rule of Ivan the Great, and when it did, there was a blending of ideas and culture. The more liberal, artistic, right brain leanings of Novgorod encountered the more conservative left brain waves of Moscow, and the two clashed at finding a new homeostasis or balance. Leading up to this period of mandatory reconciliation, a new school of thought had begun to flourish in Novgorod. This new school of thought would come to be known as the Judaizing heresy, and it arrived in Novgorod by the way of Shakira, Zechariah bin Aaron Ha Cohen, who was a Jew and by all accounts, a student of astrology, astronomy, and hermeticism. Although the story of the Russian crown has characterized Zechariah, 
as an instrument of Satan and an authority on every evil device and a student of magic and necromancy and astronomy and astrology, as George Verdansky acknowledges, Joseph Sanin, whose words are quoted here, was a staunch opponent of Judaism. Therefore, we must accept his evidence only with some reservations. In any place, case, it is plain that Zachariah was a highly educated man with extraordinary spiritual gifts. Note that Joseph Sanin is also known as Joseph Volotsky. Joseph Volotsky is a major contributor of polemical pamphlets and literature during this time and is one of the leading, if not the leading, representative of the clergy advancing the anti-Judaizing perspective. Ivan the Terrible is reported to have been tutored along the lines of this monastery and philosophical movement, the anti-Judaizing heresy of Joseph Volotsky. Verdansky goes on to summarize the inner teachings and spiritual contents of the heresy, writing, another group which the proponents of the heresy included in it were those who sympathized not exactly with the religious creed of the Judaizers, but with their teaching, both philosophic and scientific. A characteristic feature of the Jewish learning of the late Middle Ages was the work in the realm of the Hermetic philosophy, the Kabbalah, as well as that of astrology. As a result of the spread of the heresy of the Judaizers in Muscovite Russia, there followed also a spread of astronomical and astrological treatises. This was a new sort of revelation which attracted to the Judaizers those people who did not care for their religious teaching. It is known that Theodore Kirshkin, the chief protector of the heresy in Moscow, was among those who were deeply interested in astronomy and astrology. With the mention of Theodore Kirshkin, secretary of the foreign affairs of the Grand Duchy, a brilliant diplomat who became towards the end of the 1480s the actual leader of the Muscovite foreign policy and who enjoyed the complete confidence of the Grand Duke, we notice that the inner circle of the heresy comes very close to Ivan the Great. By some accounts, Ivan the Younger and his wife, Elena of Moldova, are intimately involved with the heresy, and there is even mention of Ivan himself being familiar with it. However, the bottom line is that the philosophy and science being asserted in the heresy would, in effect, undermine Ivan's power and authority as divine representative, judge, and executor of God's will. If the people were taught align along the lines of the heresy, each person would become self-empowered to fulfill Ivan's role for themselves. In addition, a central unified religion is known to be an asset when involved in the process of nation building. Ivan the Great is not called the gatherer of the states for nothing. For these reasons, Ivan the Great really had no choice but to insist that the Judaizing heresy was put down. And so, true to form, this is what he did. There's another interesting facet of this situation, and that is that the fact, and that is the fact that all of this was happening in an eschatological climate. Apparently, the liturgical calendar that had been in use for ages in the Russian Church expired in 1492 A.D. As students of religious studies well know, apocalyptic expectations make for interesting times of high tension and extreme flights of fancy and superstition. When the world did not end in 1492, a new liturgical calendar was created. However, this situation of apocalyptic expectation certainly fanned the fires of colorful religiosity in all directions during this time period. The fact that Ivan the Younger died during this period and that he and his wife may have been sympathizers with the Judaizing heresy also served to escalate tensions. The result was a hot ballooning situation of quickly moving, often deceitful information and irrational belief.
By all accounts, the episode of the Judaizing heresy was deeply polarizing and viciously politicized. In the end, the true faith cast out with scorn the Judaizers, along with their sciences and philosophies. The fact that this is a tragedy to the grandson of the story here, Ivan the Terrible, from the author's perspective, cannot be overstated. The decisions that were made in this episode in the saga of the Russian crown were detrimental to Ivan as an individual soul and as a king. If only Ivan the Great had known how desperately his grandson would need the warm embrace of the ever-present imaginal queen consort, something that the philosophies of the Judaizing heresy would likely have helped him to realize. Would he have chosen differently? Maybe so, maybe not. But as it went down, mercy and compassion were not in the cards for Ivan. Ivan was instead tutored along the lines of the writings and monastical order of the anti-Judaizing polemicist Joseph Volotsky, a zealot with sanctimonious piety for the true faith. As Gary Lockman writes, Joseph Volotsky was an ascetic and an authoritarian and demanded strict adherence to the rules of ritual, dress, even of gesture and movement. His Christianity was harsh to the point of sadism. For Ivan, God existed in the divine archetypes, above and outside the geocentric spheres of the material universe. The present tense, warm breath of the Dakinis and the participatory nature of our experience with the cosmos eluded him because at this point in the history of religion, here in the inroads of the epoch of Pisces, the teaching of Christianity was that God and Jesus were not in this world. They were in heaven, and here on earth, our means of connecting with God came via the Holy Spirit, who worked via supplication to icons and by magic transmutation of the Eucharist and by absolution by God's chosen divine representatives. This is why Rudolf Steiner indicates that in this time period, the epoch of Pisces, the goddess had been imprisoned in a statue made of stone. Rather than the flashing recognition that the whole of nature is alive, the Christians limited the concept to the Holy Spirit infusing itself only into intimate holy relics. It was a quiet, still presence. Without the living goddess and the warm, fresh, revelatory nature of the feminine principle in religion, there is no quest or goal. For what is the purpose of awareness without reception, of bold, courageous sovereignty without reflected appreciation, or of a million far-flung arrows shot into the dark without an objective? You cannot have coincidencia oppositorum or the union of opposites with only one side of the equation present. As above, where the divine masculine and feminine come together to create the child, so below, here on earth, we cannot reach our goal by will and mind alone. We must couple the air and fire with earth and water and marry the mind and the will with love, beauty, fertility, appreciation, and fecundity in order to grow our offering or our rose for the beloved. As is taught, enlightenment flies on two wings, both wisdom and compassion. And Ivan, his religion only allowed him access to one. So it's really no wonder that Ivan, try as he may, could be nothing other than a confused and frustrated broken-winged bird. It seems there were a number of ways these teachings came very close to Ivan the Terrible, 
via the Judaizing heresy and also via Neil Sorsky, another opponent of Joseph Volotsky that encouraged engaged participatory experience over rules and orthodox discipline via the Hesychist tradition, but whose influence also didn't make it to Ivan the Terrible. True as this may be, or may not be, we modern students verging into the epoch of Aquarius would be remiss to dismiss the fact that for these people and this time period, the true faith served a noble purpose. It was stabilizing. It provided safety. We might also notice that when times are hard, we tend to question less and try harder to pull more weight and get along. We additionally might note that the worldview and mythos of Eastern and Western mind are very different. Nevertheless, our subject today is the astrology of Ivan the Terrible. Therefore, consideration of his natal imprint and his life story necessarily involves some consideration of spiritual practices and the condition of his soul and his soul potential. As a soul conscripted into such an important role in the kingdom of Christendom during the perilous times of the fall of Constantinople and the loss of control over the Holy Lands, we might expect the God of the Christians to have sent both a warrior and a devoted servant. Ivan had this sense of destiny about him evidenced in his natal chart. However, in the end, the higher expression of Ivan's natural potential remains largely unrealized expressing instead in ways that are diluted, confused, and twisted. If the natural potential was there, the problem then must fall to how Ivan was nurtured. After hearing the tragic details of Ivan's life story and learning of his behavior patterns, it's not unreasonable to suspect that something was off in Ivan's spiritual, religious education and faith development. For some reason, when it came down to it, in his darkest hour, Ivan's faith was not able to see him through. Whatever salvational process of theurgy Ivan was being encouraged to practice, well, something was darkly and terribly off. As astrologers, we know that both planets and the elements that condition them or the zodiac signs, have both higher and lower, lower potentials of expression. For instance, during the season of the Earth sign of Virgo, if the weather is particularly dry, hot, and windy, there can be danger from fires in the late summertime. The entire harvest could catch fire and be reduced to ashes. On the other hand, in a mild summer with occasional rainstorms, the late summer days of Virgo is the time for the harvest moon and the bounty is ripe. Preparations are made to make sure the harvest is processed and sorted and that the storehouses are prepared for the fall and winter and that the bounty is distributed in such a way as to settle our debts and to be of devoted service. With grounded pragmatism, we review the year. Consider the yield and how we might prepare the soil during the fall and winter to manage the yield and the next year's growing cycle. The weather affects the elements that condition the expression of the planets in the chart. And it is my feeling that had the weather or the conditioning in the external environment been different, Ivan would have expressed his potential differently. Even given the unfortunate eighth house position of his son plus Mars in conjunction squared by a fifth house malefic Saturn, Ivan had potential. With advanced astrologers and proper care, the expression of the planets could have been remediated. But Ivan was not cared for. He was twisted and perverted by the weather that affected the elements that conditioned his world. But rather than give you the psychic friends download, let's take a look at the placements and the evidence from the astrological science.
And on that note, we'll see you in the next video where we take a look at Ivan the Terrible's natal chart and biographical information of his lifetime. See you next time. Bye.